Welcome to A Dram of Outlander. This is Desiree, your podcaster and the writer for A Dram of Outlander.com. For all things Outlander from the Dinah Gabaldon book series to the Stars TV series and anything interesting that falls between. This is podcast episode 180. And today we're going to be covering two episodes of season five, episode 503, Free Will, and episode 504, Company We Keep, The Company We Keep, excuse me. And the reason for that, I'd like to say thank you, thank you for being so gracious and patient with me. I started a brand new course, uh, an online course in chemistry and I have great fears surrounding chemistry based on my first experience many, many years ago. And I'm pretty sure I figured out why I struggled so deeply with it. Um, it's because I was struggling with algebra at the time. And now that I have gone through algebra and algebra two again and understand it and I'm good at it, it makes chemistry a much simpler process, even though my brain as left-brained as I am, I do not commit formulas and equations to my brain. Like, I can't just be like, hey, this is, you know, this formula for this. Okay. Density equals mass divided by volume. Totally got. Super easy. <laughs> Fahrenheit minus 32 divided by 1.8. Is Celsius. Like some of them I'm getting, maybe I'll memorize a whole bunch. <laughs> and I'll just do a podcast about the formulas I know. Huh. So I feel like I'm trying to channel Claire here and figuring these things out. But I had a very challenging start to this course because the second day of the class, I ended up having to be with um, a dear mama of mine at the hospital for a preterm delivery induction that was medically necessary. And I was basically gone from my home for 48 hours. I came home for a few hours in between those 48, simply to take a shower, grab some food and get an hour nap. And then I was back again. So it was very difficult. And I had an instructor who um, is not gracious about what is happening in my work life. So uh, it, it has taken me this long to get my bearings and to get on top of everything and recover and move forward. So I wanted to get this recorded before episode five, because then I would have three to make up. So this one is good, definitely going to be Beardsley and Brownsville, double trouble, right? <laughs> Okay, so the episode of Free Will, I have all these notes written up, and I've had them written up for two weeks, right? Almost. And it's really interesting because I have pages of takeaway. I didn't write very many notes for uh, the last episode, but I have like several pages. I only have like a page for the company we keep. I think it was a very tight episode, as was uh, Free Will. Um, but off the top, I like the theme of Roger just feeling like he and Jamie are just not in sync, that they're just not on the same page, that he thinks that Jamie just doesn't believe in him and and doesn't trust him, doesn't value him, even though Jamie's really trying to. He doesn't really trust him because the guy is a 20th century man. He is a historian. He's a musician. He definitely does not have the skills like Brianna does to survive in the 18th. So there is that tug of war and that struggle. And even though he blessed their marriage and he's trying really hard to keep Roger safe, that was part of making him a captain. And he's trying to integrate him by making him a son of his house and all of these things. Roger 
in both episodes, Roger is just like, he doesn't believe in me. He doesn't trust me. I, uh, and he's really having some insecurities. Like we'll see him do really well by making decisions and, and coming from a position of strength. Like when Jamie sent Roger ahead while they went to the Beardsley and Jamie said, you keep going and conscript, conscripting men and we'll meet you in Brownsville, right? Before we go to Hillsborough. So keep going and picking up men along the way. And Roger did really well. The widow that he came across, whose two sons he promised to give back, you know, bring back safely. He can't really promise that, but he did. And he has this confidence that was starting to build, right? And so along the way, they're picking all this up. And the reason they parted ways is because Josiah and Keziah Beardsley, we found out they were twins in episode 503. And they entered the camp. And then Jamie and Claire were going to the Beardsley residence, the, their property, in order to get their indenture paperwork because he wants to free them. And then they can come and live on the ridge and then Claire will operate on them, whatever, do all the things, right? But they had to go and get that. Well, he sent Roger and the men they have on their way toward Brownsville and picking up men. So we're seeing that Roger is having some movement forward. Like he's kind of getting a feel for it. He doesn't really know how to command, but he's working on it. You know, Jamie put him in charge. So obviously he has some trust for him, but he's going to do things differently than Jamie. And Jamie's very particular about his soldiering. So Roger really only has academic knowledge. I always laugh and when things have come up in my midwifery practice where I was like, wow, well, so that's no longer academic. <laughs> I now have clinical skill. It's not like we get to practice twin deliveries, like we're not supposed to do them in our state. In other states, midwives can do out-of-hospital twins. And I, I, this is where I'll say I don't want to hear opinions on the lack of safety for twins in hospital, out-of-hospital. A skilled provider right? Makes a difference. Fraternal twins generally are safer. So I'm not going to debate that. <laughs> and, you know, but I have in the hospital attended a client I transferred for twins and I, I supported her and the doctor who was overseeing her allowed me into the birthing process. And I really partnered with her um, unofficially and it was awesome. But now I feel like, okay, I have that hands-on twin experience for delivery that is so vital and so key because sometimes they can just happen. There could be an unknown twin in there. Sometimes, no matter how many ultrasounds, they just show up. I mean, it could happen. So it's one of those things where it's no longer academic, <laughs> where I feel like I was like, oh, yes. And what was, I'm just going to take an aside for a second about that is like for Rogers finding out that these things are no longer just academic that he's reading on paper, he's having to actually walk them out. And it's the same kind of thing. That's what I think at least. I wish you could just see my face. I made a face that <laughs> I can't describe to you. So Roger's kind of going through this thing and he feels fairly established with Brianna now. He doesn't really know her depth of anguish and trauma yet. I mean, he's starting to pick up on it from seeing the sketches of Bonnet. And so he's feeling fairly settled, but you know, not great. They had a really sweet goodbye when they left. So... Roger's on this continuum, right? And 
leading in from him having sort of these great experiences in episode 503 where he's able to get men and he takes them on their way and he's on his way to Brownsville. The men are following him. He has Fergus right there with him and it's great, right? So they get to Brownsville in 504 and all of a sudden there's gunfire. Now there's this one character that I don't think we were given his name until episode 504. I mean, we could have looked it up, but I don't think he was ever called his name. And it was the young man that at the cross burning, when Jamie was, you know, called Roger and was calling the men t- to swear an oath to him, that he came before Roger and swore his fealty. So <laughs> that's Isaiah Morton. And for book readers, we were all like, ah. Uh, again, I think that this episode, these two episodes also were very uh, overall expertly crafted when it comes to adaptation. I'm a little remiss thinking outside of season one, like seasons two, three, and four, I think parts really, really struggled with adaptation and voice. And I think this season, they're finally getting it. I don't know what the magic pill was, but I think it's finally coming together. It's sad to me that we didn't see the same kind of cohesion and voice in the other seasons. Not totally. I think last season was better. But seasons two and three were pretty, there were some very, very rough spots. I mean, highs and lows. And this has been so much more even. I mean, I did have some issues with episode two, of course. But three and four, I found to be just really tight. I have very little to say as in criticism. Some people took... uh you know, are taking Roger being kind of treated poorly. And I don't think so. I think we don't get to see his internal dialogue like in the books and they have to actually show his angst. We have to hear it. We have to see it. We have to feel that tension between him and the 18th and being a 20th century man and his relationships. Like he walked all last season. (laughs) He just walked and freaking walked and freaking walked and then end up being sort of tormented by the tribe he got sold into. He was essentially a slave. He was a dog and an injured dog at that. So, and then he found out that Brianna was raped and that she was pregnant and baby may or may not have been his. his. Like he took some serious hits. I mean, it was bad. I mean, even the fight they had and then being with Bonnet and then getting beat up and sent away. Like he just had a rough road and he walked a lot. It was like he was going to Mordor or something. (laughs) He just, that's, that reminded me of that. It was like, wow, are we, what are we doing here? You know, (laughs) is he Frodo? Where's his um, Samwise Gamgee? Like we need that. He needs a, he needs a sidekick. If he's going to go through all these hard things. So we're actually really hearing Roger's voice almost for the first time. We really got to see a lot more of Brianna's development last season, but we haven't really gotten to see a lot of Roger. And so he has a lot of catching up to do, and he's still very traumatized from his experience. He's struggling with the idea of staying in the 18th. Like he's like, let's get the F out of Dodge. Let's go back. And Brandon's like, but I don't want to go back. And Claire's like, please go back. And Jamie's like, but family, I don't want him to go back. (laughs) So we have all of those things that are building in to these decisions that are coming up, right? And so I'm glad we get to see him. I don't think he's getting treated poorly. I think it's a matter of character development that we just didn't get last season. You know, and I'm really grateful that the trauma that Brianna experienced is actually being shown truthfully. Like she's being 
challenged sexually with Roger. Like she can't have an orgasm. It seems like she feels vacant and scared. She's still having this fear. And we saw that really come out with her in episode 504, The Company We Keep. And the titles of both these episodes, I've been kind of been rummaging around my head a lot because I've had time, even though I've been swamped. They've been in my head while I've been thinking, I got to get these podcasts done because there's so much to say. And, but we really kind of saw the fruition of that fear when they are back in at the ridge and she finds this coin and that we saw it at the credits and she finds this coin with Jemmy's betting and Mrs. Bug says, oh, a man said he was, you know, like a handsome boy and who does he favor his mom or dad and Brianna is sure that it's Bonnet because no, she hasn't told anybody she knows he's alive. Nobody's told her. I mean, again, secrets breed problems. <laughs> They're the enemy. Bring light to every situation. That is one thing that, no, they just don't. And she hasn't even told Roger, right? So now she, then she has this sort of flip out episode uh, in 504 because Jemmy is not where she left him and he was, and she starts panicking and yelling for him and she's sure Bonnet took him that he's there. I mean, they're far away. They're like a, a what, one and a half week ride from Wilmington. So it's not like Bonnet's going to just easily show up there. So she panics and is running around yelling for him. And then Marsley is like, it's okay. Like I have, let's go have a drink. He's fine. He just came out to get, you know, he, there was something he dropped on the ground and he went out to retrieve it, but she's like in this blind panic. And then she tries to play it off. Oh, I just made it up. Oh, I just made it up. I mean, I'm, Again, not a huge fan of Sophie Skelton playing Brianna. Uh, however, this season, she has really, really, really grown in her acting chops. She was a bit wooden before. And now we really are seeing that emotion. So she's really learning and growing. And in that, I can find a much more believable um between her and Richard Rankin, they have their chemistry just seems like it lit up. And I think part of that was her ability to like emotionally exude. And I have to imagine being around Richard Rankin and Katrina Balfe, who are really excellent at that. Like Katrina is fearless emotionally. Like what she will put on screen is incredible. That's why it was so great to see her and Tobias Menzies off, off of each other because playing off of each other because he's just the same way. The way that their faces change, the way that they exude, the way that they are just like full throttle. They don't hide anything, you know. Sam emotes too. It's just different. There's just I think Katrina just has that thing where she can just, uh, it is just utter fearlessness. Her, uh, it's amazing. And so I think Sophie Skelton being around people who are so just free with their craft and the way that they do it, I think it's really helped her um, as an actor. And I, we really see the benefit of that this season where she's that mama bear. She's that terrorized woman. She's that wife who loves passionately. And we get to see all those things. 
You know, she's the thinker. She's the artist. And we are seeing all of that. And, but her, she's believable now where I'm not like, okay. Like now I'm like, all right, it's her version of Brianna. Like she's made it her own. I still don't think she has the, the command. Like I would have expected her to have if she was built more like Brienne of Tarth from Game of Thrones, where she was big and tall and, you know, not graceful. Uh, Gwen. That in character where it, and Sophie is very graceful and she's not very commanding, but I think she's finally come into her own power as an actor where she can hold that space. And I'm believing her. I believed her that she was terrified for her child as a mother. I believed her in her relief. I believed her the whole time through. So that has been excellent this season. So I'm just giving her some serious kudos because now I think it's the cohesion is just so much better. They're all gelling in a way that we haven't seen before in the ensemble. It's like we've gotten there. It just took her a while to really unpack and repack and learn Brianna and who she was as Brianna and to really just grab it hard. And I'm thankful for that because now she can stand up in the same scenes as her fellow actors. And we're not like eye rolling. So I like where they're taking her and that they're allowing her to feel this and to worry. And her act of quote forgiveness when she went to the jail was to release her, but it's by no means complete. When we have trauma and violation and assault, we heal in a spiral. It's all humans. And things can, as time goes, and if we're processing well, the burden of it lessens, but we are forever changed. And as that, as that spiral, we come around with it in that spiral and it comes in front of us again, we have more to process. Like she has things to process having to do with sex with her husband. She has things to process in her fears as a mother because she told him it was his child, which ugh. that was in the book, by the way. And I had the same response. Ugh, why? Just because you think he's going to die? Like, there's no guarantee he's going to die. So we're seeing that. And we also have seen the malevolence again of Bonnet. Like he is just mercenary. And it's a different kind of evil than Black Jack Randall, who is power. It was hidden. It was within the confines of this space that he had control over. And he was sadistic. And he wanted what he wanted. Bonnet, it's just his code. It's all for him, whatever gets him from A to B. And it's public. And it's raw. And it's vicious. And that's what she has to contend with. So the secret, you know, and I'm thinking the company we keep with her is that secret. She's keeping that secret. <sighs> Very interesting. And Marsley, I think, is fantastic. I mean, I like how her character has expanded. It's a little confusing with the medical stuff and her being in charge of the penicillin, which is very strange. <laughs> and I did look up the whole penicillin thing in great detail, and it is exceedingly challenging to make it 
and to make sure you safely make it. It requires multiple steps, lots of ingredients. And so, yeah, it is not as simple as finding the right mold and then harvesting the liquid that the mold lets off and isolating it. There's several more steps along the way. It's on prepper websites if you want to find it. But here's the thing. If you made your own, it might be good to use on your animals. But I don't know if I'd want to use it on humans. And <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's, it's a long shot. Anyhow, so putting her in charge of all of that makes sense with Claire being off of the ridge and other things going on. But we'll see. And now that we know Claire needs that penicillin, I'll get to that in a minute, at the ridge, maybe Marsley isolated some and saved it off to the, saved that, you know, broth off to the side. Um, but I really like what they're doing with her. And they're really giving her more of a presence. And in 504, she was the calming force to Brianna, right? Where she was like, it's okay. I know what to do for waking nightmares. And she gave her a drink and they talked and she get, Brianna did not open up to her about what was bothering her, but we had some like wisdom from Marsley and, you know, she says that she killed her father, you know, and she didn't, she had prayed for him to stop beating them. It was her mother's second husband. And when he got arrested as a Jacobite and died in jail, Marsley was like, well, so I killed him because I was asking God to take him. I wanted him to die. I wanted him to stop. And, you know, in the conclusion, it was like, well, of course I didn't kill him because I thought that, but it helped release some of what was going on with Brianna and it's interesting their relationship growing because there's a distinct relationship I've really missed Brianna being able to have. And I'm glad to see that she's finding some, some relationship with Marsley. And I also like what they're doing with Fergus. He's still a little goofy, but he's, given a job. He's the one in charge of the whiskey. And he's also traveling with the militia men. I don't know what exactly he's doing. He only has one hand. So I think he's there just to be of support to Roger, but he's active and he's not brooding. And he seems much more vibrant and happy than I would expect. The other thing with Roger coming back around to him for a minute, because I'm not using notes here. I'm just, just talking to you and I have notes in front of me, but they're not in any kind of order. Coming back to Roger and what's going on with him is that I love that at every opportunity we are getting to hear him sing. And it's beautiful. Richard Rankin has a beautiful voice and he's very talented and that we get to hear him singing. We get to see him in his element. And even though he and Jamie are knocking heads in episode 504, he makes, you know, he made a command decision when they got there. Oh, back to Isaiah Morton. That's where I started this whole diatribe 15 minutes ago is that when they got there and to Brownsville and all of a sudden all the Browns men wanted to shoot Morton or shoot all the, the men unless Morton was handed over. And Roger was really scared at first. Well, of course he was scared, but then he decided, oh, let's just give it to him and we'll figure it out like when Jamie gets here. So his idea was, I'm going to say, you know, not shed blood. I'm going to find the most reasonable, peaceful decision. And I'm going to give him whiskey. 
because he didn't know that Isaiah Morton was already married. He didn't know Isaiah Morton, quote, violated Alicia Brown and not only slept with her, had sex with her, but ruined the opportunity that her dad had at brokering a marriage that would have been really beneficial to the Browns. Because So there's all sorts of upset. Now there's still another kink in here that I haven't gotten to yet. So Roger allows Martin to be taken and kind of locked away by the Browns. And he's like, hey, if that keeps the peace, okay. And then he goes and talks to them and he gives them whiskey and everybody's happy and drinking a little too much whiskey, you know, but they're all partying and having a good time. And about this time is when Claire and Jamie arrive. I'm not quite sure of the timeline and I'm going to get back to them at Beardsley's. I'm going to come back around to that in a minute. Um, because it took them a few days to get to Brownsville. So were they there for 12 hours? And Roger and the men were only there already for half a day? I don't know. I mean, it's quite a distance that in my head. So timeline's a little screwy, but it's TV, whatever. So we are getting to see Roger. We're getting to see him critically think, apply the skills that he does have, say, as a professor and historian, and not shed blood, and to keep control of the situation the best he can. But he was like, hey, I'm going to give him booze. That might help. <laughs> I'm just going to stop this where it sits. And it did help for a while. So before I move forward with the rest of kind of what was going on in episode five and that dynamic, we have to go back to, or four, I'm sorry, episode four. We have to go back to episode three, free will. Because when they broke off and Roger went on his way with the men and the Beardsleys, boys, Josiah and Kaziah, Kaziah, I love that name, went with Roger and the men and so Claire and Jamie went to the Beardsley property, right? So this is where they diverged. And Jamie's like, I want those indenture papers. I need them. I want them. I want those boys free. So he was going to talk to Mr. Beardsley, who was a trader. Trader, not traitor. Uh, and... The property is kind of in just not in great shape. Jamie's knocking on the door. He's looking in the windows and sees goats in the house. Um, one of the stories that the Beardsley twins told uh, was that the reason that Keziah didn't have any pants on was because he was in the barn, sleeping in the barn, and the cat had kittens on his pants. <laughs> So Claire went to go check out the barn. Um, and of course we see cute little kitties on the pants. And so she was like, oh, okay. So they are telling us the truth in so far as she knows. Okay. There's a horse, a beautiful horse there and everything's kind of in ill repair. And Jamie's knocking on the door, sees goats, like I said, and then a face is staring out from the window. And that's Mrs. Beardsley, Fanny Beardsley. And she comes to the door and he tells, you know, she tells them that her husband is dead. He's like, we need these papers. And she's like, well, just keep the, I don't care. Keep the kid, you know, keep the boys. And he's like, no, no, I need this. <laughs> and he's like, well, you, so they get into the house and it smells horribly. There are goats running around. And it's just filled with claptrap and 
she is just has a mood about her. You know, she's just kind of angry. And standoffish, and she's looking for the papers. And they're just kind of looking around the house and... Huh. Hmm. Okay. And then Jamie hears something. And we're like, oh no, he draws his gun. And it happens to be that the male goat <laughs> is in the cupboard, the pantry. And he lets the goat out. <laughs> So there's all the suspense, right? There's a cross on the wall that we see. We also get to really see more of Jamie's uh, religious nature, his faith really coming out, which I adore. We need that. His faith background really gives the reason for his decision-making processes and his philosophy. Uh, without it, it's really hard to understand his beliefs and why he does what he does. So then Claire decides to go look upstairs because she's just being nosy as all can while Mrs. Beardsley is looking through the papers and can't find what they want. And she says, don't go up there. And so Claire runs up there, right? And of course we see a very injured, stinky, disgusting Mr. Beardsley on the floor in his own filth, maggots in his leg, gnarly, right? I happen not to have minded the maggots or anything. None of that stuff bothers me, but I could, it's not for the squeamish, right? So Claire, of course, is compelled to try and help him. He's had an apoplexy, which we call a stroke, and half of his face is palsied. He can't talk. He can blink and he can't really move. Um, she had all she was doing was sustaining him and torturing him. She was keeping him just alive enough. And how Claire went to go look upstairs is because liquid was seeping through the ceiling. <sighs> that gives me the willies hardcore. So, you know, she's like, look doing a once over on him and Mrs. Beardsley is very unhappy about this. And Jamie comes in and it's just horrifying. So they decide to move him downstairs and into better light because she's going to treat him the best that she can. She may have to remove a f the foot. There's all these things going on, but she's like, maybe we can take him to Brownsville and somehow get some, he, he, he'll be removed from here. Right. So this dynamic is pretty rough. And I'm actually really, really glad that they did this. I wasn't sure they were going to. Um, but it was a pivot point for so many other storylines and how they have combined so many s different things to converge is really quite masterful and amazing. Because all these things don't go together in the books, not the way they are in, in the show. And they're just being very good at keeping the meat of it, which I appreciate. So they're going through this process and trying to figure out what to do. And then Fanny tries to like kill him. They're like, you've had all this time to kill him. Why are you trying to kill him now? <laughs> so she and Jamie kind of toss all and it's like, she's a strong woman and she's a young woman. And she ends up getting like thrown up against the wall. The cross falls down and her water breaks. Like, of course, they don't know she's pregnant. She's a little bit of a fluffier mama woman. And all the clothes she's wearing, you could definitely hide a pregnancy. Obviously, she's not, you know, 40 weeks, but whatever. So they end up, so Claren ends up catching the baby, delivering the baby, or helping with the delivery, whatever. And... This is, so that is about the court. And so that was really well done. I have no, as a midwife, that was like, great. They've done a good job with birth scenes on this show. <laughs> Except for her trying to do an external version on ruptured membranes and a breech baby, whatever, you know. 
That was kind of funny <laughs> way back when. Uh, that was Jenny's baby. So, what I really loved what came next was that Claire had had some really deep tenderness towards Mrs. Beardsley. And anyway, she just really, she really felt for this woman. And she didn't even know why yet. And then after the baby was born and Mrs. Beardsley was just kind of reclined with the baby and they really had this touching moment where Fanny Beardsley told her story and how she got there and how many, what number of wife she was. And, um, yeah, Jamie and Claire discovered the baby's father was black. Here's the thing. The pigmentation changes don't come in right away with the melanin. It takes a little while. Uh, babies who are of darker skin tones or who will be, uh, it doesn't come in right away. They're very fair um, skin color generally, but there can be some markings on the body that show that there is definitely like a darker skin and lighter skin parentage, a uh, mixed. So they discovered it right away. <laughs> Whatever. It's close enough, right? So we do find that out. And yeah, Fanny Beardsley was pretty obnoxious to her husband about the baby not being his. It was pretty gnarly. I mean, I get why, because he was an abuser. And we learned that she's, what, wife number five, and that all the other wives were buried under the Rowan tree, and that sometimes she saw um, one of the wives' ghosts. Hmm. So we did get to get that sort of creepy spiritual side, too. And, you know, she says that having a baby doesn't make you a mother. And she's absolutely right. There are women who never are pregnant or birth a child, but they are the most incredible mothers, right? It's they adopt a child or they're the auntie to everyone. And they just, they, they so lovingly guide and parent children in some capacity, even if they don't have their own, that's the heart of a mother. And then there are women who have children who have no, they're just, they're not, they don't have that mothering instinct. And it is best for them not to raise that child. If they can have some, you know, if they can adopt their baby out or have someone in, or in somehow have someone else raise their child for them. And that's okay. It has, it, you know, however, it's going to work, right? And so that's when Claire learns about Fanny's name, too. And the tenderness that she exudes toward this young woman. And she just, she wants the best for them. And she wants there to be life and joy and happiness, right? Freedom. Um, but it's really interesting. And to see the change in... Fanny Beardsley from fighting, fighting, fighting to surrender, surrender. Um, I know the episode was called free will, but I think it had a lot more to do with choices and surrendering than it did to do with the free will of choice making. I don't know. You let me know what you think. So, and then we come to the next thing where in the morning, Fanny Beardsley's gone. She leaves the baby. She leaves the documents. She leaves the property documents because that's the inheritance for the baby. Because by law, she's Beardsley's, even if she's her father is black. So they wake to find her gone. And I love that Claire fashioned a, a sling to wear the baby. I was like, heck yes, Claire. <laughs> Put that baby up against your chest. And then she went and milked the goats and uh, made sure. I mean, goat milk actually needs to be fortified in order to be 
long-term palatable, but in a pinch, you could definitely use it. I actually was a goat milk baby. My mother told me I was a, I was born 10 weeks early and I wouldn't tolerate formula. And back in the late 1960s, they didn't have mother's pump breast milk, you know, cause breast milk was vastly inferior to formula, but I wouldn't tolerate it. And I lived in an area where there were many farms and ranches and they supplied me with fresh goat's milk. <laughs> I really do think that that's why I love goats. I mean, I love them. I've actually had a goat in my life and I would love a pair of pygmy goats again. They're just de delightful to me. But you can have goat milk in a pinch, you know, for a short time. It just doesn't have all the right nutritional values that humans need because we're not baby kids. <laughs> we're baby humans. So we get to see this in Claire and how she nurtures this baby. And she's, you know, also talking about what do we do with Mr. Beardsley? We can do this. These are all the things. She's like, I have to treat him. Jamie's like, I gotta go. I got places to go. We gotta get to Brownsville. And so Jamie's like, okay, I'm going to give him a choice. Like if you'd put a dog out of his misery or like when they put, you know, it's like you put Rupert out of his misery. He didn't want to be killed. That kind of thing. If you would do something for a soldier, why would you not do it here? Right? So he gives Beardsley the option of having Claire care for him and take him to Brownsville for treatment or to allow him to die, to help him die. And Claire gave that tincture to Colin McKenzie. And she also helped her patient, her old elderly Scottish patient in Boston pass. So there is a place for that. And Jamie was very clear. He, and then he asked if he could take his confession and Beardsley did not want it. And he, he agreed that he just wanted him to shoot him, like to stop it, to put him out, to allow him to die. And Jamie did. And it was just so moving. The whole episode had so much depth to it. And I just love that. Again, I think we saw four different acts of faith on Jamie's part related to faith or five. And to see how he handled that, it was just beautiful. And that we're really getting to see the king of men. We're really getting to see Jamie doing Jamie things, how Jamie would do them. And the question was posed to me, like, would Claire have allowed that? Of course she would. She understands the way of things. She's not going to step in the way of something that she knows is a reasonable choice. And so they ended up leaving with the passel of goats <laughs> and a cart and horses and the baby in a sling and the papers for the Beardsley twins and all the property papers that are the baby's inheritance. So she's a wealthy baby and it doesn't matter how she came in the world. Legally, she's a wealthy child, right? So that was amazing. I mean, it was a really, to me, a great episode. And I'm wondering if I missed anything besides Claire learning about Bonnet. Let's see. Blah, blah, blah. Oh, the one thing I love is that Jamie said, may God forgive us both before he shot him. Um, and Jamie also had some thoughts about his own father because his father died of an apoplexy and he thought he would have died instantly. And Claire is like, yeah, sometimes people hang on. Sometimes they suffer. And she's, you know, assured him that Jamie would have, that 
learned from Jenny if his father would have suffered. And she's like, no, most people do die. And he hoped so. And he made her promise, swear to me, Claire, if it should one day fall to my lot as it did to my father, swear to me that you will give me the same mercy that I have that wretch. So he makes her swear. And she agrees that she would do whatever she had to do. So we have so much that going on here. You know, we have Bonnet. <laughs> we have this baby. We have Brownsville. We have the regulators still that to contend with that we haven't seen. We have Tryon. We have Knox. We have all these things happening. And then, now I can get back to Brownsville with all the things there. That when Jamie and Claire get there with this baby, she's like, I got a problem of my own and I need to find a nursing mother. And so she goes to meet the Mrs. Brown. Excuse me, one of the main Mrs. Browns the lady of the house and there's somebody Lucinda who can nurse the baby. She's lactating. So Claire's like here and what we learn in this process is that Alicia Brown, the daughter is one of the daughters of course is in love with Isaiah Morton she has slept with him. She's, that's it. She wants him. And now she is just gutted over the fact that they're probably going to kill him. He's locked up. And so Claire's kind of getting to know Alicia through this process of things happening, getting a space, a room set up for her and Jamie to sleep and all the other, where is everybody else going to sleep? So she's helping this process along, this young Alicia is. And then we have Lucinda, who's nursing the baby. And in this process, we find out that Dr. Rawlings recommends, was printed from that broadsheet, in the broadsheet, because Fergus, that's the paper that Fergus picked up and scrawled his notes on that Jamie wanted printed. And nobody, everyone thinks it's stupid what she wrote. <laughs> But she's, it was only for the ridge, so she's worried that's going to cause trouble getting back to them, right? So we have that little thread hanging out there. What about Dr. Rawlings recommends information? How's that going to come back and bite them in the ass, right? And where are we going to see Stephen Bonnet? He's coming. And we haven't gotten back to the regulators, like I said, in, and to Hillsborough yet. So, and Murtaugh. So we have lots of things swirling around that have to coalesce. But while they're here, like Jamie decides to let Isaiah Martin go. He's totally annoyed with Roger. And even though Roger explains himself, he's just aggravated with him and doesn't believe he was leading properly. And I think he's being really hard on Roger from his vantage point. I think he's being very hard on him. And, um, so he's just kind of irritable about this whole thing and dealing with all of this. <laughs> but we have another thing come up is that Kaziah also has horribly inflamed tonsils. And Claire, for some reason, thinks that Kaziah got it from Josiah. Some people just have crappy tonsils. <laughs> Heck, I had tonsillitis six years ago. It took me about three weeks to figure out what it was. I even went to my doctor, which I hardly ever go to the doctor. I was like, I have something going on with my throat. I have some kind of infection. I did all like the hippie witchcraft I knew, and it wasn't getting better. And it was getting worse. So I went in, and then even the doc was like, swab me for a strap and cut something else. And she's like, I'm not sure. You definitely have an infection. I'm just going to give you a broad spectrum antibiotic because I'm not sure what it is. And I kid you not, I paid 125 bucks for that doctor's appointment. And on my drive home, 
10 minutes away, I was like, oh, I have an infected tonsil. Well, I'm of an age where I think my doctor would have assumed I had my tonsils removed because nearly everyone in my age group and slightly younger had their tonsils out. It was a normal routine procedure. I don't know why. It doesn't happen anymore unless it's necessary. Kind of went out of favor in the like mid 70s, late 70s. So when I got home, I called and talked to my doc's nurse and I was like, oh, I figured out what's wrong. I have tonsillitis. I said, I want to make sure that this is the right antibiotic for me still. So then the nurse called me back and said, yeah, just take it. But hey, I even had tonsillitis. I don't know what caused it, but the antibiotic worked. So there you go. So she has to operate on these boys and she needs the penicillin. So hopefully, rounding back to that penicillin again, Marsley will have, you know, isolated it and she's got the penicillin broth to deal with. Now, the thing is that broth is not going to be great orally. <laughs> she doesn't know what strength it is. I mean, injectable would be like, but injecting that is like without the quote cleaning process and filtering process, whatever. It's totally terrifying to me. Like, cause I'm in the 21st century, right? <laughs> but Claire doesn't have any syringes to inject it unless, you know, she said Brianna makes them or whatever. So we get to see some partying going on and Roger singing and it's gorgeous, like I said earlier. And ostensibly Morton is gone and Alicia is just distraught and doesn't want to live Claire finds out she's pregnant and nobody else knows. It's just, phew. This should be like the triple threat. Beardsley, Brownsville babies. <laughs> Woohoo. So there's lots of babies going on. And fertility talk about Marsley and Fergus too. Like babies everywhere. And I like that they talked about that this baby deserves love and to have a family and a home no matter her beginning. And it sort of reminds me of how we have to look at Jeremiah in case he is Bonnet's baby, right? Biological baby. And Frank raised Brianna, even though no matter how she came about, and Roger was adopted by his uncle, no matter, you know, because his parents died so we're kind of getting that lovely theme of adoption and families are what you make them. And Fergus was born in a brothel and now he's married to Jamie's stepdaughter and Jamie's son. So come on. Yeah, I love that theme. That's like, woo. yes, your family is what you make it. Um, and even Claire was adopted by her uncle. So it's awesome that we have that. So as the stuff is going on that evening and they've made the decision that Roger is going to be taking Claire and the Beardsley twins to the Ridge and then meet back up with Jamie. Um, Claire learns that Lucinda's baby died and Lucinda and her husband would really like to keep the baby. Nobody's even talked about the birthright of this baby, the papers or anything. So Claire is like, huh? She's like, well, think about it. <laughs> Thank you for letting me know. So then we see, this is like the best whiskey ever. It's obviously, it goes real far, like those candles burning. And people are dancing and singing. And the other brown brother comes in back into town. And it's all, things are good. You know, they're decent insofar as they can be. And Jamie does the dance like Murtaugh did the dance back in what season two. And he and Claire go off into the wood together and he wants to talk to her privately because we still have this issue of what are we doing with this baby? And it's so sweet. They're a bit inebriated. So we get that nice humor. And then he asks her if she wants wee Bonnie to keep her. 
And it's really obvious that he's sad that they never got to raise a child together. And heck, he never got to raise any of his, you know, his two biological children were raised by other people. I mean, Lord John still has William, right? And Frank raised Brianna. So it's like, he's never had this opportunity. And he's like, if I can give you a baby for us to raise together, I'd like you to have the option, you know? And it was like, oh, so sweet. And I love how they treated this. And then Claire brings up, maybe she can stay here in Brownsville with Lucinda because the option has been brought up. Maybe it'd be better. And she's like, I love our life. Like I miss the fact that we didn't get to raise a child together, but I love where we're at. I love what we have. And besides Marceline Fergus, will you know, have fertility for the whole ridge basically. But I love the tenderness and the humor and how they communicated their regret of not having raised a child together. And as hard as it is, it's okay. But she appreciated so deeply that he offered it to her and that it was on his mind that it could be really important to her. I mean, they're in their 50s. Uh, the idea right now at about the age of, you know, Jamie having a baby. Oh no. Grandbaby. Sure. Like my own baby. Oh no. Mm -mm. I threaten my children with life and limb all the time. If, you know, for some reason I have to raise their children. I'm like, Oh, mm -mm, that's not happening <laughs> unless there's no other option. So their moment is interrupted by a gunshot and they run off over there and it's Alicia Brown. She's in her shift. It's cold out. She's got a gun and she misfires and grazes her shoulder and she just wants to die because she really believes Isaiah is not coming back and she can't see a future for her and her baby. Like she's just out of her mind. And so they take her back to where the room they were staying in, which I'm pretty sure is the same honeymoon room. Uh, looks like it's the same set building that they used for the, the honeymoon and the inn where everybody was feasting down below after Jamie and Claire got married. Uh, but she tends to her and they're talking and she's like, you gotta live. Your baby's a reason to live. Like, girl, you got your whole life ahead of you. And then she tells, Alicia that he's already married and, but she doesn't know the details and Alicia is just beside herself. And so Jamie goes to get whiskey because whiskey is the answer to everything or tea, right? Uh, <laughs> and he finds Isaiah Morton downstairs and he's like, Ugh. he's like ready to like shoot him himself. And he's like, I love her. And he explains, I've been with my wife for two years. We're estranged. We never wanted to be married. And Alicia is my heart and soul. She's like the moon and the stars. So Jamie's this kind of a romantic softy. He's like freaking A. Takes him upstairs. He and Alicia have a moment and, you know, or he finds out she's, Jamie had told her that, told him that she was pregnant and everybody's all, whatever, he's excited. And then Roger comes in and was like, what the hell? Morton. <laughs> And then Morton goes on this speech about, you know, everybody being a fool who's in love and who wouldn't do anything possible for the person they love, no matter what the circumstances. And, you know, they're all like, you're right, dude. And so Jamie arranges for them to leave together at, early in the morning and there's noise and they let all the horses out to cover the tracks of Isaiah and Alicia's horse tracks. So subterfuge. So they don't even know she's gone yet. They don't know anything about that. They just had to go trying to find the horses. And one thing that I thought was really excellent was at the end. And this really made me think because I had to stop when Claire did her voiceover. And I'm so glad they're including some of those. I really wish we got a little bit more of Claire's internal dialogue because that's where some of her like humor comes in and we would get to know kind of why she does what she does, but Hey, can't have everything all the time. 
Here's what she said. Adultery, betrayal, dishonor. Excuses could be made, of course. I know I made my own when I was separated from Frank by a power I didn't understand. And yet, wherever you are, you make choices. Foolish ones or ones that save yourself or someone else. All you can hope for is that the good will outweigh the harm that may come of it. And so the company we keep, you know, like Jamie kept, or Roger kept a weird company in Morton. You know, of course, Jamie, that's the company he was keeping. Alicia was keeping company with Morton. And so I think when it comes down to it, and Claire talking about choices, right? And were they going to keep the company of the baby? <laughs> Brianna keeping the company of her fear and trauma and bonnet. I mean, in her, internally holding on to that. They're keeping the company of lies by not sharing that they know he's alive, right? Bonnet's alive. So we have all these choices, Roger's choices, his choices that got Jamie mad at him again, seemingly mad at him, right? And disappointed. And he's just not quite fitting in where he needs to. And what is he going to do with the information that he knows that Brianna is drawing Bonnet? Jamie's choices, like he let Martin go. He let Martin and Alicia go. So twice he let the man go. His choice of what to do with Roger, having him go ahead of him and then sending him back to the ridge and then to meet up with him. What is he going to do with Murtaugh, right? Their choice of the baby. His choice to help Beardsley die. His choices in dealing with Tryon, knowing he's going to be a turncoat turn coat at some point. Claire's choices, the penicillin choice, you know, be damned, germs of the 18th century. Her choice of writing those things down the Dr. Rawlings recommends. How is that going to affect them? Her choice of bringing, having that body that they were using for autopsy, right? Her choice of including Marcely and Roger in the things that she was doing. Her choice in what are we doing with this baby? Her choice in wanting Brianna and Roger and Jemmy to go to the 20th. I mean, so there's a lot going on, right? Brianna's choices, Bonnet's choices, the Browns, what are they going to do? And Morton's choices. He's choosing love and he could have gone to divorce. I know that they happen then. But now he's a bigamist, you know, or would be bigamist. So I do like how they wrapped up with that voiceover. I think it really tidied up the two episodes. And there's some really, we can clearly see the threads that are dangling that need to be answered. And I'm super impressed by how they wrapped all this up into a package because Fiery Cross is just a brutal book. And for readers out there, I mean, the way they're incorporating aspects of the gathering and just dropping them in seamlessly, like Roger singing and doing the things that he's doing and talking to the widow with the two sons that he brought into the militia. I mean, amazing. So we are really getting to see the important pieces and bits from the gathering. Even if they're off, you know, kind of off screen, like Jeremiah getting baptized by the Protestant minister, right? heretics. <laughs> so we are getting to see so much and it was very expertly done this season and I'm loving it because that's the sign of a good adaptation. 
the elements they add make sense for the story they're trying to tell and the elements that they keep and weave and shape from the books make sense for the story they're telling. And so it's been very artfully done this season and I am just really impressed and I can't wait till the next episode. Ah, so thank you for sticking around and listening and (laughs) my cat is going crazy right outside the booth. I would love your feedback, right? Contact at a drama of outlander.com is my email, or you can find a drama of outlander on Facebook, the page or the group also called a drama of outlander on Instagram and Twitter. It's dram of outlander where you can find me at Desiree Andrews on Twitter. Also, And you can call the voicemail line 719-425-9444. That's 719-425-9444. I had to think of it for a second because I almost gave out my fax number like I did a long time ago. (laughs) I don't know, 75 episodes ago or something. So yes. So I want your feedback. I want your thoughts and your questions and where you think these storylines are going. Like, what are they going to do? Like, where are we going to see Bonnet again? Like, how is it going to coalesce? We keep seeing Roger doing what he does best. Is there more to come for him this season? Is he going to find his place? Is more havoc going to be uh, wreaked upon him? Are they going to leave the baby with the Browns? What's going to happen with the regulators? Is Brianna going to heal? What's going to happen about that body and autopsy and Dr. Rollins notes? Yeah. And wow, who are the Beardsleys going to turn into? I mean, they're obviously going to be important characters. And it seemed like Lizzie was kind of like, "Mm," looking at Josiah and thinking he was pretty cute. Where's that going? How many babies will Marsley have? (laughs) And when are we going to hear from Leary again? I mean, they still owe her a crap ton of money. Are we going to see young Ian or get an update? And what's going on with Lord John? There's a lot. Okay, so thank you for listening. And I hope you all are hale and hearty. And until next time, Slangevin.